Thank you for tuning in to Convos with Kinu. I am your host. We are here with a special guest uh, coming back from Iraq. His name's Normetti. Uh, Normetti was born in Iraq. He grew up in uh, Detroit and moved back to Ankawa in 2008. After graduating from college in Detroit, he co-founded Shlama Foundation uh, in response to ISIS infiltrating the Ninwa Plains in 2014. Uh, thank you for being with us, Noor. How was everything, man? I heard you just got back. Yeah, but see, Mahon. Um, I mean, what what can we say? Uh, yeah. The colors of our shirt represents how how our heart is at the moment, just completely mm -hmm. dark um, and full depression. Um, it's been the most difficult five, six days uh, we can imagine. I really thought like the suffering that we saw during ISIS days, well, we would never see in our lifespan again. So it's impossible. You know, a catastrophe like that happens maybe once every hundred years when it comes to our nation, unfortunately. How is it possible it's going to happen again soon? And there it is again. Uh, this pain is just as painful as it is in 2014. Um, it's been very difficult to uh, to just wake up and actually function. Um, and, and, uh, and actually go on with our lives, but it's not, it's not easy at all. And mm -hmm. it's just another yeah. challenge, like the many challenges that we've had in our, in our nation. So when did you, where, where were you exactly when you first heard about this that happened? What was your response to it? What did Shlama Foundation do? What are, what was Shlama yeah. Foundation doing to yeah, help for, people in need? Well, first of all, I, I just, just a reminder, you know, Shlama Foundation is made of volunteers. You know, none of uh -huh. us have this as a job. We, are, we all do this because we're passionate, just like how you're passionate with your podcast. We all have normal jobs. And then in the, in the middle, during our work days or after work, we, we try to provide, uh, you know, uh, services for our people as much as we can so that we can help our people. And it's been working great for the past nine years, over 260 projects. We've passed $2 million dollars. And we've done this all with not even a single real office, uh, no administration fees, like, uh, you know, salaries and, and, and cars and things like that, even though those things could be really helpful for us. Um, and then, you know, we have different project managers here and there. And one of them was also a board member, really good friend, but my best friend, like my brother, is not even from, my brother um, is, is from Baghdad. He's in Baghdad, Mark Mansour. So... Um, you know, he, he texts me a message to tell me, Noor, Kaditha, Kaditha. And it's a, that's an Arabic word, like catastrophe, catastrophe. I'm like, oh, God, please don't. No, no, don't, don't tell me another thing. So, you know, we get, we get on the phones, what's going on? And then we don't know how many people are there, but it's all up in flames. Um, so um, right away, you know, my heart just sank, like, a, you know, a complete a feeling of devastation and just praying hopefully as many people as can come out as possible there's a thousand people there i'm like oh my god just please please lord help them find a way so um couldn't sleep that night right away we're trying to understand what's going on what's happening and the first 24 48 hours was complete chaos we, still, we didn't had no idea in terms of how big the catastrophe because we don't know how many people were were lost mm -hmm. uh, because because they pulled a lot of people from the hospital but we don't know how many people were actually still inside there so um we're waiting and 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 we said well we have to start you know here here we go again um just like what happened before so uh, we started with the fundraiser to try to get as much support as possible to start acting so day day two uh when we learned okay uh, the government saying, yeah, we'll, we'll take care of you. We know right away. Uh, we know what that means. Wait for us two, three days. Uh, by then, we'll bring that medicine. We're not going to we're not going to let that happen like we saw before. So um, right away, we started coordinating with our with our volunteers, created a medical unit and let's go. <clears throat> started first talking with Huyada and we're like, what's going on? Uh, we have we have Musul, the hospital Musul saying uh, to the patients that are there who are burned 50, 60, 80 percent. Being told, well, we don't have this kind of specific medicine that you need in order for you to heal. It'll come from Baghdad uh, after two days. We said, uh, please, we found the same medication in the hook. Uh, here's the money. Go bring it to us. We're waiting for you guys. 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 
5 a.m., they would go and then bring it to us, and we would start providing uh, support for those badly injured patients uh, in, in the hospital. We can't even post pictures because how bad it is in the hospital. Those that are between 20% or less that are burned were, were sent back home. They were like, we can't even take care of you because we don't have enough space. All the Erbil, the Hook, and Mosul hospitals that know how to deal with burns have, have been full to its capacity. So they, they cut it off at the 20%. You're 20% badly burned. Yes, you need medical attention, but you're going to have to go heal at home with nobody visiting them. So that's when AAS, you know, Shlama, we had to step in on the ground and we, we had to start taking care of those at home. Um, and those medical mobile units became very handy, uh, very crucial, where, you know, they're going in there and changing the, you know, bandages, putting the things that they need in order for the skin to actually heal um, so that the pain is less, so that the scar hopefully in the future is as least as possible and as much of the feelings come back as possible. So those are the two things we're doing, providing uh, equ equipment, medical uh, medicine for Jumhuri Hospital in Mosul and uh, going around the clock in coordination with AAS um, in Baghdad from homes to homes. There are 300 people, Khon, uh, there are 300 people in their homes in Baghdad that are in need of daily medical care. Some of them they need three times a day. So it is a task that is supposed to be done by the government. But uh, we can't depend on that. And we've, we've, been, uh, we've been having our teams going around the clock and, and visiting these homes. <clears throat> so... So since we're not having um, that care, who's who's helping the people in need right now? Is it is it Shlama Foundation hiring uh, nurses? Is it uh, uh, well, Syrian Aid Society? First of all, when we first were told that the government was going to pay for everything and stuff like that, that made us very optimistic. And for the most part, they've they, they've done that. Like the patients that are being stayed in governmental hospitals in our build the hook in Mosul City and Baghdad, there's a small hospital also in Baghdad and the clinic in Baghdad, they're they're being taken care of. While sometimes the needs are uh, are like finishing real fast, okay? Uh, at least the stays are being paid for and taken care of by the government. Okay, but the needs are sometimes being uh, depleted. So that's when, you know, uh, AS and Shlam is right away buying it from other cities and bringing it. And now we're even starting to buy from Turkey because some of the things have run out. We started contacting people in Tur Abdin and Istanbul and we started bringing stuff from uh, from those places. So, so that's, that's, that's the big portion because those are 30, those are 25% and higher in the hospitals. Um, those, like, you know, we, we need the government to step up and, and we're, you know, some are surviving and some are not. In the past three days, we've had five deaths. In the past 48 no. hours, I'm sorry. In the past 48 hours, no. we've had five deaths, including a six-year-old. Including a six-year-old. And of course, the rest are all young too, teenage girls and boys and, and whatnot. Um, in the, on the ground in, in Baghdad, like I said, um, we're, we're trying to you know, coordinate between those that are working, uh, AIS and, and Shlama, uh, trying to go, use these mobile clinics. Now, you said, you know, are, we, are you paying people and stuff like that? You know, everybody's providing their services uh, for free. This shouldn't come as a surprise to you, actually. You know, when you when th these are people from these area, when their own people are like this, they've all had a cousin or a friend who they've lost. A nurse is like that, a paramedic is like that, an assistant is like that, a driver is like that. Um, they're all coming together. They're all working for free. They're all everybody's working for free. There is no, but the expense is these really crucial burn treatments, and some of the stuffs are really expensive, like these advanced high technology that. Uh, many, unfortunately, can't afford. Most can't afford in Iraq. Uh, each box costs about $500. These are cellulite. Um, again, I don't know these scientific terminologies, but these yeah, are yeah. things, that, they're like human tissue that if they put it in there, then it brings back the skin and will help with the pain and with the healing of the burn and, and the feelings. So um, we're trying to just buy as much of the stuff as possible in order for, the, for, the, for these people to feel as less pain as possible day by day. So, as you know, a lot of a lot from the diaspora is bringing, uh, donating a lot of money um, from every state, from every country. Um, there's a social media presence right now with Assyrian influencers as well, uh, urging their followers to donate to the cause. And we've seen some uh, great things happen in terms of uh, donations. Um, where is so you're saying that it's difficult to get these medicines. Where are these medicines? Where where could we get them from? Is it just Turkey? 
is it a specific country we you guys have to go to or, or how, how does that work? So we first started looking abroad because we also had such a major response from doctors, Assyrian doctors in America and Canada and New Zealand saying, hey, we're ready, we want to buy. But of course, we quickly realized medicine is a lot more expensive in the West than uh, you know in Asia, uh, in the Middle East. So it was not possible for us to buy at such high price. Uh, medicine is a lot cheaper in, in, in Asia continent. So um, some of the stuff we just started finding in Turkey. Turkey is the best option because it's our neighboring country, so we can bring it easily through the border. You know, uh, the, the transportation becomes a lot less, and the prices are reason are the same as similar as Iraq in terms of them being uh, low. So that's where we started now. Uh, now we started uh, bringing some of the stuff that we don't have uh, in Iraq. But for the most of the stuff, we, are, we do have them, thank God, in Iraq. But some of these things, like we said, um, they're, they're running out, like this much amount of burn treatment was never inside the country when they think that you need it for uh, 500 people, um, 400, between 400 to, to, you know, approximately 400 people needing burn treatment at the same time. So um, that's what's oh, happening. Man. That's difficult. It's heartbreaking. I mean, I, after I seen the video, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Like, like the first thing I thought was just like, uh, how? How did this happen? Like, how did this happen? Like, I know you're on the ground. You've been back home. You moved from Detroit to live back home to serve your people. What, like, what, what have you heard so far? How did this fire? What's the speculations you're hearing? Because here in the states, we're hearing a lot of different things. What have you heard since you're on the ground? So, Khun, look, right away when it first happened, um, you know, it was obvious with the videos and the pictures. Um, it was really a uh, a big tragedy where you know a lot of bad things came together, uh, including the roof being lit on fire uh, through through some of these fireworks. Now um, you know fireworks inside the hall is common in Iraq. I'm sure I think it is also in America for these kind of celebrations. Of course, not fireworks like like going up in the air, but sparks. Um, uh, so it's not something you know uh, unusual. So that was normal. But what is unusual, unfortunately, is how some of these structures are built and maintained in such poor way. Um, and, and, and that's what it seems to lead to a roof. If you look at the video, that quickly, quickly just caught fire within seconds. And within 10 seconds, it collapsed and fell, um, led to this, this tragedy. Now, uh, the Iraqi government released actually its investigation today, and it also blamed it on that. Um, you know, you know, a, a, com a combustion due to fireworks and very poor quality of material that was the building was built on. However, as you know, like, you know, other people are, are saying different things. I'm not going to get in, in, into that, but mm -hmm. you hear some of these things, you know, some people saying deliberately it was done, um, you know, because of various, various things, various, you know, political, yeah. political reasons. They're saying, oh, this is an, a, a political attack on Assyrians or a political attack in Baghdad or a political attack, uh, you know, on the people uh, because of some things that have happened. Maybe you've heard in, in Sweden, you know, that's yeah, related to it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not going to get in, in, involved with that. All, all I can think of right now, all my mind is how can we get as much support as possible uh, for our people so that they can live as much of a normal life as possible? Now, do you know how many people have died thus far? What is the number? So the the report that came out today from the government, they still put the number at 107, which is still which, it's surprising all of us on the ground. Because from what we have, from gathering for all of them, the names that we have, we have it at 114 with another 30 still missing. Like still nobody has been found. They've looked in all the different hospitals that people, patients were taken care of, were taken to at that tragic night. And 30 people are still missing. So um, eventually those people will be uh, uh, labeled as, as dead also. Um, you know, maybe some have been just, and it just hurts just saying this, but maybe some have just been burned so badly that yeah. you can't even find them. You know, you, you, then there's nothing left of them. So, um, um so yeah, so so while the government says 107, we're 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 saying 114. So it's it's, it's over 100. That's for sure. 17, 107, 114. Does it does it really matter? Like, is that what they're focused on? Like the number? It doesn't matter. Even 20 people is 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 a lot. Now, there's um some things that 
Americans here, they, they feel like they're not doing enough. What is it that we could do here in the diaspora to help Shlama Foundation and organizations like Shlama Foundation? So, uh, the response uh, from the diaspora has been really amazing. And it's, it actually has blown the response of 2014 during ISIS. Um, not AAS, not anybody. All collective Surai organizations have never raised this amount of money that we have now. And we thank God, that, you know, during these dark times, we should try to find some things to be happy about, even though not, not, nothing can make us happy at the moment. Um, the response, though, from the diaspora uh, pouring in uh, with donations is leading to us trying to help as many people as possible and decrease uh, the wounds as much as possible. And this is really crucial, really crucial. It's even saving people's lives because, you know, these kind of wounds, even if you are 20%, if you have the wrong bacteria going in, you know, it can kill you. It can kill you. So um, thank God. Uh, I don't know why the response is bigger today than it was in 2014, maybe because social media now is more bigger mm -hmm. part of people's lives. So, it ha you know, I don't even remember if there was just a thing called GoFundMe in 2014. Or and I'm certainly know for sure there was no way to raise funds through Facebook and Instagram in 2014. So I guess it has become easier for the diaspora to be connected to the uh, homeland organizations. Um, so, 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 I mean, unfortunately, I mean, that's, there's only one thing. Well, no. I'll take it back. There's two things. Your donations are important, and we thank you. And it's up to you to donate to, to who you want. And any donate, any anyone you donate to, is, is a good it's a good deed by you because we, everybody's working from their hearts uh, with 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 genuine intention. But besides donating, um, even though it's difficult, even though it's impossible, uh, maybe now it's not the time for it. But we need to we need to try to be as, as optimistic as possible, okay? We need to try to hold each other's hand and, and try to be positive and not just throw away everything. It hurts, uh, Juan, when you hear people saying, well, I can't live in my land anymore. No, we, we, can't, we, can't, we can't shut down. This can't be the final chapter in our nation. And the diaspora is part of the nation. Just because you don't live in your land doesn't mean you're not part. You're, you are 100% part of the nation. You are even a bigger part of the nation because you are the financial backer of, of the nation. So um, we need to continue to be who we are, uh, you know, which is a Syrian, and, and try to continue to hold on to our identity and try to work hard. And I know it's hard, but try to work as much as we can in order for us to, to, to uh, keep our nation alive. And I know, again, no other nation has seen what we have, but we have to keep on going. We have to move forward. <clears throat> We have no choice but to be strong, honestly. Um, you're on the ground, as I mentioned earlier. What are the people that have been through this tragedy or family members um, of this tragedy saying? Are they, are they saying they want to leave? Are, are they frustrated? Are they angry? Are they sick of living in the homeland now? Because it's like we're... we're it's continuous. It's every 10 years something has to happen. We can't even have a freaking wedding. We can't even have a freaking wedding in peace. So people, I know people back home are really fed up. They really, I heard on a video that someone said that they want to leave, but I, I don't know. You're on the ground. What, what are you hearing? And sadly, as painful as it is to, to me to tell you this, and I'm the most, if anybody knows me, knows that I'm the most optimistic person when it comes to our situation. I would say, you know what? It's fine. You know, it's, it's, I know you feel uh, like you're completely handicapped by losing 90% of your population in 20 years. But, hey, let's just keep on trying. Let's keep on building. Let's keep on strengthening this village with that village. Um, you know, despite us trying to continue to hold on, it's, it hurts when you see the victim saying, oh, I don't want to live here anymore. Uh, or it's just too painful for me to live here anymore because I've had such many, so many bad memories. Um, that's the people in Baghdad course okay now yeah. other people other people from other areas that we've also lost in the in the fire we had people from Aikawa die in the fire we had people from Karamles from Bashika from Akra uh, to die unfortunately so this thing has hit uh, many different places uh, sadly um, so it that but that expression that people are saying even the groom I think you're referring to the groom that said yes, that on yeah. the video um, it's it's out of frustration you know mm. it's out of just uh, sick of being always the target uh, be, being always a disadvantage, uh, the most disadvantage in, in, in this country. So I hope it's just out of anger at the moment and not they don't mean it. But all we can do is, is again, Dr. Cameron, uh, wake up every day and try, and try to, you know, you know, work and, and try to build on what we have in our lives today. 
Yeah, um, it, it, it really can be frustrating, man. Um, I could only imagine what what they're going through. I mean, I, I couldn't even, I mean, watching the video, I, I honestly couldn't sleep at night seeing what I what I saw, especially with that kid. I mean, you, have you heard of how many children have been killed in this situation? It's a lot, and I don't want to count it. I don't want to count it. It's a lot. You know, if you want to talk about kids and, and teenagers, it's it's half of them. It's half of them. Half of no. them are children and teenagers. Like under 20, it's at least half of them. This is our future. This is supposed to be the, the population that we were going to hold on to and build and be the future of our nation 200, 300 years now. Their offspring is supposed to be. You know, the, the, the town lost 0.4% of its population overnight. And I know I don't want to go, you know, I don't this isn't a number thing, but it's a big blow. It's, it's a, a big blow. Big no, blow. it has to one, be said. one is a lot, but but this much is a big blow. I mean, you talk about a, a, a girl who lost her mom, her dad, her brother, her sister, who lost entire family. She's eight years old. Eight years old. Who's gonna who's gonna wake her up to go to school tomorrow, hon? Who's gonna make her lunch for, for school? Who's gonna bring her back from school? Who's gonna do her homework with her? Who's going to buy her clothes? Who's going to walk with her when she gets married? The, you know, um, the, the, the money that's being collected uh, uh, is not going to be used just today or tomorrow. This is going to take a lot of time. I don't know what to say. I don't know if I want to say months or years. It's going to take a lot of time to heal and a lot of effort to try to uh, preserve as much and, and, and heal the wounds as much as possible. Well, I wouldn't even th think of it like that because, I mean, it's devastating just thinking about it, man. Um, have, I, I know there's things being said um, about the government not doing as much as they should be doing, um, especially with the investigation. The, the investigation, it was, I think it should take longer. It should but done more they should have went more into the investigation and i know a lot of our people back home were frustrated um and actually came out and spoke about this saying that they want international um communities to investigate what happened in baghdad have you heard anything of that sort is there going to be international yeah. investigations going on or is it there's just not, there's not going to be international investigation unfortunately but yeah the bishop of Baghdad has come out and says i reject this uh, this investigation he rejected mm. the findings uh and the decisions because the decisions it's another uh it's another issue uh so with the investigation result they also made decisions to fire and i believe possibly also take to court the mayor of hamdania district the head of electricity, the head of municipality, the um, I believe the whole governorate civil defense, and and a few others, and most of these are Surai. These are Dedaia. These are the people's uh, village. These are from the village. So, the bishop and, and the Surai there, they, they, they don't want this. They, they say you're 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 putting more pain in our wounds. How you how you remove our own people? All we have is is a mayor. All we have is a couple. You know positions that are key to to, to manage our affairs and who, who are you going to bring you're going to bring the khraya um so so they're trying to fight this and actually from right away since so today they're like Noor, please can you call the us can you you know talk to the us embassy to the us council you got to explain to them that we can't accept this and they have to hold our backs and they i'm like well, unfortunately the whole politically the whole world has forgotten this politically the whole world nobody nobody intervenes anymore uh, on behalf of us so I, yeah. uh, there is there is no intervention there's no inter international intervention unfortunately i just think it's you know me man I, I i question everything i just think it's very weird when it comes to like i'm hearing this now that most of the you know assyrian officials are being fired yeah now you, you, just, you just saying that just lit something in my head why are they getting fired well, they're trying to put, they're why? trying to put the blame on, on people. They're, they're trying to say, fault? "Oh, we did our job." The government's trying to say, "We did our job," and this is their fault, and that's it. And that's what, and, and but that's not the case, you know. Um, uh, uh, halls, you know, breaking the rules of having lots of people going, a thousand people instead of maybe they're only supposed to hold five hundred, or the building is built wrong. 
That happens everywhere in Iraq. Everywhere, every exactly. Every single town, every single every. village today mm -hmm. has illegal buildings built with illegal materials that can be flammable. And you saw what happened in Karbala. I believe it was Najaf Hospital about four or five years ago, three years ago, uh, where 70 people died in, 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 in the government hospital. Baghdad Hospital also, like six months later, another fire, another 50, 60 people died there. Um, you know, the government didn't remove, you know, anybody from from those positions. So why, why are you attacking us more? And, you know, you want to you want to change it. You want to make everybody safe. Well, you got to implement a nationwide program, not not look for people as scapegoats. Well, this is my opinion. This is my opinion on it. And and. I think there there. Something was done in order for this to happen. Something was done in order for Assyrian officials in an, an Assyrian town be uh, ousted out their positions. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but we I just feel think terrible it's all about weird. that. And we we didn't we, we because we know these people. We've worked with them. These are good-hearted people. These are actually people who are the most professional when it comes to their job. Uh, and the previous prime minister even called uh, Baghdad, you know, Handani district, the cleanest district in Iraq because of how well maintenance it is. And, and that's why the Pope actually visited it because he felt so safe and how uh, how great that, you know, the district was built back up thanks to, to our officials. But don't you we, question that? Mahkad, of course, we, we are questioning question that. We're, that? But we're trying, like, to, we're trying to fight it. Uh, you know, the people of Baghdad are actually talking right now about what's their response. Will they protest or not? And, I hope they find the strength to, to protest these decisions and then try to reverse it because it's unacceptable. Okay, well, we have to do something here too. We have to do something here too, not only back home because we know back home, we barely have a voice. It's only when we put pressure on our, our government here is when they start putting pressure on them and then that's when they have to do for us. It's always been like that. So what is it? that you would urge American, Assyrian Americans to do here uh, in America? Would you urge us to rally, protest, go to Washington, D.C.? Because uh, there are some Assyrian politicians here in America that could come together, unite, and uh, go to Washington, D.C. and bring um, voice to this issue. Khan, I think we've learned with our experience that protests don't really get anything accomplished. They raise awareness, which leads to maybe more support, like financial support, donations, and that's great. Uh, but the way, you know, unfortunately, that it, it works in America is is lobbying. You know, you have to know how to play the game, and playing the game is through lobbying. You need, you don't need, you know, a thousand people in the street screaming. You need like five to ten people who know how to get into these rooms and convince certain individuals to take actions within the government. I am not an expert when it comes to lobbying and trying to convince the government to do something, but I do know people know, but I do know there's people that's, that's their expertise. And unfortunately, that's one thing our community in America has not accomplished is mm -hmm. build an effective lobby group in, in DC where we're literally non-represented in DC. And that needs to change. DC needs to be a big portion of our people, a big portion of our nation. And, and we need to start investing, you know, young men and women to make that their career. And uh, I hope I hope we find a way because that's the only way we can start being an, uh, effective uh, in terms of getting the U.S. government to to do anything or even to say anything. Now, is it Iraq making these decisions, the government of Iraq, or is it the government of Kurdistan? Well, the the investigation. Uh, if you're talking about this specific thing, yeah, it was the investigation by the Baghdad government, the Ministry okay. of Interior. The Ministry okay. of Interior came out and announced this. So this decision came from Baghdad because you know Hamdaniyas. It's under Nainoa, uh, and Nainoa is, is under federal Iraq. So, so what is the Kurdish government doing about this? Are they doing anything? Are they? I helping? haven't heard in regards to 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 the removal. Uh, no, to the well, everything in general, to the removal, to helping our people. Like, well, the our, removal anything? only happened today, so uh, I, I haven't. I don't think I've seen a response. There's no response, but I'm not sure what the KRG can say or do about in aid. So in terms of aid, I, I can't really speculate on it, but like I said, we do have people who were taken to Duhok and Erbil because uh, those are the nearest towns. Sorry, Got those it. are the nearest cities. So the hospitals there um, it, it do have our people, and I believe we have 47 in, in Erbil hospitals and 20 patients in Duhok hospitals. Now, from what I understand is the governmental hospitals, the, the KRG has said they'll, they'll pay for everything. 
but unfortunately because really? some of yeah but unfortunately because some of them are full or they don't have good quality because you know these government hospitals are not really good quality um they have so some of them are going to private hospitals these private hospitals of course you know they're, they're not owned by the government so they do, the, our people unfortunately do have to pay and they are paying and we're trying to find different organizations and and including us to, to try pay for that um to, just for you to understand even though it's again it's not nothing close to the way how health is expensive in the west but it's really expensive in, in iraq when you think about how much is the salary the average person uh, each each day with all the medical needs that a person needs in the private hospitals in the, in the KRG, it's about 1.1 million dinars, which is about $700. Uh, maybe $700 a day is not a lot to, to a person in, in, in the U.S., but it's it's a lot. Uh, that's, that's literally an entire month's salary, and they have to pay that every day. So um, we're trying to get that addressed and try to find ways to try to utilize any governmental um, uh, resources in order to minimize all the expenses. The cost wow well we're, we're doing the best we can over here i know <clears throat> donations are going to keep coming in we're going to keep spreading the word because like you said man this is not this is not something that just one two three weeks this is a lifetime you know the especially these children that are that lost their families their their parents man it's it's it, it i'm I'm like speechless. Like I, it's breaking my heart with the things you've said, and and then just be being here with you and talking with you. It's just um, making me a little emotional because I didn't even think about that. You you just brought that. Like I didn't even think about what that child has to go through now for the rest of their lives. It's not like a two week. This is gonna be a lifetime. So it's gonna have to be. From the diaspora, continuous donations. We have to continue helping our people through this tragedy, man, and and let them know that hey, you, your your voices are heard. We're we're not forgetting about you. Like we're always gonna be here, be here for you. You guys l live there, but we support you here. We want we want that message to always <sighs> resonate with our people back home. That you guys aren't don't don't think. We're not helping out. We will always help out in tragedies like this. So what is your message to uh, our people in America? What would you want them to continue doing? Well, to not forget about uh, the people back home. And don't, you know, like I said, the response has been amazing. But don't wait until a catastrophe like this happens for exactly. you to be connected to the homeland. Exactly. Connect to the homeland on, on a regular basis, uh, you know. Connect, try to meet people or organizations that are there and just try to get to know them. Now with Facebook and Instagram, you can easily talk to people and see if with, how you can be part of their lives, even by just being friends. Um, but, uh, you know, even through direct support, uh, you know, it would be appreciated. So just don't forget us. Don't forget. We won't. We definitely won't, man. I'll be honest with you, Juan. I really like can't even talk uh, more about I get it. I get things it. outside of, of the fire because all I can think about is, is is the victims. But if anybody wants to know what what Shlama has done, is is through a click of a finger. You can look it up. You know, we're the only organization that puts every single receipt on our website and is translated, and you can see what that project was, and pictures and videos. Every single project we've matched it with a YouTube uh, link. Shlama, Shlama, Shlama Foundation dot org. Just Slama, just Slama.org. Slama. Okay. You go to Slama.org and then you click on projects. Um, every single of the 260 projects, we make sure we have videos, photos, and receipts for. So you can easily go there. And uh, our mission will never end because our nation will never end. And and I know it's, it was a it's kind of a difficult question to ask for you, but a lot of people have asked me, who's Shlama Foundation? What is Shlama Foundation? Which is why I brought that brought up that question. Well, we, like we, we're, heard, yeah. We're a group of volunteers. That's what we are. We're like-minded people. Um, and while the idea, you know, you know, um, started like, you know, because I grew up in Detroit, so we started getting support from from Detroit. But now, alhamdulillah, we get support from everywhere uh, in order for us to to help our people. And we have an amazing team back home in Iraq, um, where you can always come and, and meet them if you like. Um, and these are all again volunteers, uh, people who are like us. They want to keep our nation alive. So we try to do what we can project by project in order to help the situation. Well, <clears throat> and it's not one person, it's not two people. It's it's a good team. It's a it's a really good hearted team. And, and it is so I many know. special people. You might you probably know some of them, you know, Fadis Jama is well known. 
um, you know, a lot of people that make make the Islamic Foundation special. Yeah, when I went to Iraq in 2017, man, I felt like at home. That's that's all like it felt like home. Everybody's loving, caring, and the amount of support, man. The amount like if when a tragedy happens, it's great. It, I love that how our people just come together at once and volunteer. They don't care about money. They don't care about. They volunteer their lives. They don't care, and that's what we're trying to do here in a way. Um, Nor, thank you for joining us at with convos with Kinu. I know I took up a lot of your time. Um, if you guys would like to donate, donate to Shlama Foundation. Uh, they've been a pillar in our nation. They've helped our people a lot, and now they're helping our people with this devastating uh, tragedy affecting families, not for months, not for years. It's for a lifetime. So always keep that in mind, guys. Uh, any last words, uh, Noor? Um, like yeah, we've already made this decision. Every single dollar that is raised in the name of this tragedy will only be used for the for these victims and nothing else. Even if we have to take many months or years to do it, that is the only thing it's going to be uh, spent on. So uh, we're, we have full transparency through our website for people to see. And we're going to actually start now listing every single receipt that we're buying all these medications so people to know, oh, they've spent this much now and, and, and they have this much left. So um, we're going to continue to to help our people. And uh, God bless everybody that has uh, helped us to to deliver this aid. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Noor. You've, you've done a lot for our people. I really do apply you, man. And uh, I hope, you know, everything... I mean, we can't say everything is going to be good because it's not. But, you know, with with this tragedy that happened, but I, I just hope, you know, our people continue donating and helping our people back home. Um, thank you for joining Convos with Kinu and uh, we'll see you next time, brother.